Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this very special program today. I'm Deanna Barnard, Barnard Class of 95 and a board member of Barnard Women in Entertainment, also known as BWE or BUI if you're on the East Coast. We're an inclusive alumni organization committed to helping each other grow and advance within the greater entertainment industry. This field is competitive, challenging, and not always fair. But with a network of brilliant, aggressive, and like-minded alumni supporting you, the sky's the limit. First, a little note for all our attendees. You will not have microphone or camera access during this online event, which means that your voices, likeness, and or images will not be captured by Barnard College. Written submission of questions may be shared during the Q&A portion of the event. Feel free to start adding your questions as you think of them in the, using the Q&A feature, and we'll answer them at the end. We also welcome you to continue this conversation after today by joining the Barner Women Entertainment LinkedIn and Facebook groups. And now I have the privilege of introducing our guests. Our first two are Barnard alumni and BW members, and our third is from across the street. Wendy Yinas is Senior Director of Programming and Development for PBS. In this role, she identifies, develops, and oversees the production of original content and acquisitions for PBS in the genres of history, culture, and independent film. She works closely with executive producers of PBS documentary series POV, Independent Lens, and Voces. Wendy is leading new filmmakers initiatives at PBS. She also has experience in, she's also an experienced journalist and Emmy-nominated producer whose work has appeared on NBC News, ABC News, and PBS. She has an MS in journalism from Columbia University and a BA in Latin American studies from Barnard. Ayana Achita is a surprise guest. We had a bit of a shakeup. Thank you for stepping in. She's a transactional attorney with 25 years of experience in entertainment and an adjunct professor at USC Law School, teaching deal-making in entertainment. Aya most recently served as Executive Vice President Compliance at Miramax, where she was responsible for developing and implementing policies related to risk management, ethics, and the company's code of conduct. She has a JD from USC Gould law, School of Law and a BA in Art History from Barnard. And Nina is our Columbia representative today. She's an Oscar-nominated Iranian-American actor, writer, and director. Nina has written for 30 Rock, New Girl, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and Borat 2, subsequent movie film. She has also co-created a pilot for FX and co-show ran the cable comedy, No Activity. As an actor, Nina has appeared on 30 Rock and No Activity. More recently, she's directed episodes of Mythic Quest, Chad, and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. She's the recipient of the Writers Guild Award for Best Adapted Screenplay, and most importantly, multiple bad haircuts during childhood. I love that little tag. Tonight, we're talking about rapid media, social media discourse, and how we create and protect our creators, our contest, content, and yes, our brands, in an era in which cancel culture pervades. Before we dive in, it bears mention that even as we speak about discussing what it's like to create today, in this environment, the environment keeps changing. Case in point, as we've all been looking at how the explosion of generative AI and the implosion of Twitter is gonna affect things, a strike has brought us to a standstill. These all promise big change, hopefully for the better, but we can't guess at where that's going. So we're not gonna guess. We are not gonna talk about the strike or uh, guess where AI is going. We're gonna talk about what it's like to create content today um, amid rapid social media discourse. And I'm very happy to now start with some questions. I've already talked about how impressive you three are. As a bit of a self-introduction, why don't you share something you're enjoying about your job these days? And perhaps give us a picture of, of what you're doing. Um, Wendy, do you wanna go first? Just cause you appear first in my screen. <laughs> sure. uh, okay, so one of the things that I'm really enjoying in my job these days is, uh, looking at, at new pitches, I always enjoy uh, seeing someone's new ideas. Um, there are so many times that you get the same topic, but someone has a fresh lens on it, and then that all of a sudden gets you excited about life again, and you can't stop thinking about anything else, and then you can't wait to tell the whole world about it, and you want to get everybody else on board, and that that always, um, it keeps me up at night, but in a, in a really good way. Excellent. 
Nina, how about you? Are you are you in working at all right now? What do you, <laughs> I don't know how you can answer this We're question. What are you enjoying? Talk about that. Dude. I know. What are you enjoying? Um. Uh. Yeah. Um. I am seeing more uh, live theater right now, and that's always inspiring and and connective. Very cool. And Aya. Thank you for having me. Right now, my passion is to help and mentor students, young alumni, and or even just connecting um, people into the entertainment industry. It's always about who you know. And so for my two L's and three L's, helping them with their resume, uh, in making introductions, because that's just my passion is to be able to see my mentees and students just thrive and grow and become great entertainment lawyers. Excellent. So with the rapid media discourse, one of the issues is that people often get blasted publicly instead of being called in per the title of this event for private conversations to address an issue or a concern. How has this trend affected the way you do your job? Um, Wendy, we'll start with you again. But feel free to chime in, anybody. Yeah, so I mean, the way that it's affected my job is that I think we're all hyper aware of anything that is being said, whether it's true or not, but we're all hyper aware and we're constantly texting, slacking each other, alerting each other about what, what is happening. Um, and sometimes it's true, sometimes it isn't, but then we're always going on a mission fact-finding mission to see if there's anything to it. So um, that's definitely different than the way that I've ever worked before. Right. Having to be ready to respond to what's happening. Nina, have you run into any of this in, in your work? Because you, you, you've done a lot of your work before it comes out. So the response happens. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's like um, being on the side that generates it I think maybe the biggest change that I've noticed is just um, the behavior of my colleagues and peers. Like uh, there's such a difference in the desire to educate oneself now. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm by no means perfect, but I think I maybe had a little bit more of that inherently just because I was often one of, if not the only person of color in a writer's room. And that was just, it, it felt like kind of a duty to try to, I don't know, represent as much as possible. So it does sort of feel like, even though this is a very sticky and kind of prickly topic, there's on my end as a creative, like almost a relief that people who are in the majority right now are starting to educate themselves about groups that are minorities or groups that have been othered or are othered currently. So it's not all on you anymore. That's, that's a great thing. That's a great. Yeah. Story. Not that it ever was on me. I don't want to make <laughs> it seem like, Oh my God, my life's so hard. I'm a comedy writer, but, but, you know, but, but I think any of us that have been in the minority in any room we've been in, there's just that there's a little bit of a sense of it, you know, and, and I certainly felt as I got older and an obligation to try to be a voice, you know, as much as I could for, you know, right. And <laughs> in comedy writers room. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you want to talk about what this, the students or maybe some of your experience at Miramax, when you kind of dealt with setting up the rules and the parameters within which everybody had to work. <laughs> oh, unmute yourself, please. As an in-house attorney, training employees on being more mindful when one is tweeting or putting something on social media about the companies and also for uh, agreements when drafting a talent agreement or writer or producer agreement, uh, adding in a morals clause and talking about, and it's standard, about how um, a person, a performer shouldn't disparage the project or the company that's hiring them. And that helps. Right, setting up the rules, exactly. So with this renewed focus on DEI, which you've already talked about in responsible program, how much does representation fit into your decision to work on a project or to back a project? 
And when, if ever, do you make the decision to call someone in, I assume we all call in, but you could talk about calling out, to call someone in, whether it's someone who's a superior or someone who works for you, when you just see that something's not right, how do you handle it these days? Anybody want to speak to that, Wendy? Well, I'll go. I mean, I've uh, called, sometimes I've called people in and I try to do it in a respectful manner. And I usually try, first I start with questions, not assuming anything because I, I don't want to assume the worst about people. Um, but there are times, for example, whether it's a, a person that I've been working with for a while, or it's a producer that I've met for the first time and they're sharing a pitch with me and there are certain images or certain scenes that in my view, they don't understand how the rest of the world will see this, even though I know that may not be their intent. So I always start with questions. Well, what is your goal? And how did you find this story? And you know, what how are you connected to this community? And what what tell me more about what, you know, why you think you're the right person to tell the story. And I try to ask questions about who's on your team. Um, and, and that gives me more insight into uh, their worldview and, and how they and what their informs their approach. Um, and then I, I ask questions and sometimes they're tough questions because uh, sometimes the more questions you ask, the more you you're there's that like that uh, exclamation point going off in your head where you're like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> it's not going the right way right yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, to sort of flip this because i feel like most of us at barnard are are familiar with calling in and, and wanting to work in projects that that have representation i think it's something we're all tapped into the other side of this is when you push the boundaries and i, I feel like you two of you do this in very different ways which we talked about earlier but where do you draw the line when you're purposely pushing boundaries when you're pushing the tr the uncomfortable truth or when you're you know making the the borat film and, and just going way over the top to 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 share a truth in a different way like how do you decide where to draw the line when you want to push boundaries and challenge the audience yeah <laughs> right i mean it's that is what we're kind of yeah totally about, right? no i mean it, that's a that's in some ways like a very good question but kind of a hard one to answer um in a good way like uh i with satire there's a certain amount that one can get away with i, I worked on the the sequel to the borat movie right. so that character was kind of already trojan horsed in from an era that's vastly different even from this one and it wasn't that long ago and same thing with it's always sunny in philadelphia those characters were created in a time that is different now and some of the fun that i think those three guys have on the show and that i got to help out with was the continued evolution of people like that in today's world um but you know in terms of the first part of that question, I just want to work with funny, decent people and at a place where I feel like I can be additive. And I don't think it's even been conscious, but more recently, that's just become me being kind of an upper level writer in a, in rooms or situations more like that, where it's, where I am the, you know, senior woman of color in that room or whatever. Um, have you been, let me interrupt ask, have you been in rooms where a joke is really funny and everybody, but you're like, yeah, but we can't do this. Like we know it's funny and half of the audience will get it, but we're going to offend people. Let's just cut it. Or do you push, yeah, like, how do you deal with that? that person? It's a bummer. <laughs> it's, it's not why I do my job, but, but that totally happens. And I didn't speak that way when I was starting out in my career. If I was 22 now, I think culturally me, I, I would hope that I would feel the cultural support to do stuff like that, but I just wanted to work, you know? So that, that came with time and seniority and absolutely. I don't know that I feel shame about that, but I, you know, I try to do good now. Um, and I, and I also have been very fortunate where I haven't been in rooms that have, I mean, it can get pretty gnarly and I, and I've been very blessed in that way to not, not be, but I'd love to hear what, what the other panelists have to say. <laughs> well, Wendy, what, you know, it's, you're coming from PBS who is telling truth and yet 
I just saw that yesterday PBS, it wasn't for your programming, but PBS was in the news because it, they, there was a grant, there was a funding that they didn't want to fund you somewhere because you're pro-gay or, you know, these things actually have an effect on, on what you're doing day to day. So what has it been like for you in, in picking stories that matter and, and knowing that in this world today, truth doesn't always, is it always accepted well? That is a, one of the biggest challenges um, in my view. I mean, we are very different than what uh, any other network. You know, I've been at other networks and, th and this isn't that. These are member stations. And because they're member stations, they can choose to have on their air what they want. Um, and they have jurisdiction over that. So I work at PBS and we provide national content for all of our member stations. And there are some programs that you will see that are the same um, in terms of what we're providing, but that's why each member, that's why each, each station has their own local programming and their own flavor. Um, and in that particular case that you just mentioned, they're going through some tough challenges because some of the things that may not be a big deal over here are a big deal somewhere else. Um, and the way that we see it in terms of the programs that we're pursuing is that we serve all Americans. We serve the American public and we are inclusive. And when we talk about diversity, we say that is diverse in all ways, not just gender, race, and ethnicity, but also region. Um, so we're going to continue leaning on facts and leading with the truth and supporting our member stations in every way that we can. Um, unfortunately, each locale is different. So they all right. have well, their here's own Here's a challenge. question that's for you, not PBS. When, do you ever see something and know it's going to have a backlash and that just makes you personally want to do it more? Like, is that how you <laughs> respond to it personally? Or am I a troll? Am I a PBS troll? Not just so a troll, but I mean, because that's, <laughs> that is funny. I just painted you as a troll, but that wasn't what I intended. I was saying, does it I know, inspire I'm you to spread truth? <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Well, there are times when, you know, there are story, stories that are near and dear to my heart. And a few years ago, I, I would have never blinked and thought that they were controversial. And there are things that come across my desk. And to me, these things are not controversial. But I know that's not the way that it's being portrayed in other parts of the country. But that doesn't make me shy away from it. Um, especially if I think it's really good and, and I think it has value. I'm not going to put something on just because it's provocative. It has to be provocative and it has to kind of check all the boxes of, of what we're looking for. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't shy away. I'm, I'm not doing anything just to stick it to someone, um, but because I think it has value. So, right, yeah. right. And Aya, this is a, a legalese, although I know that Wendy can chime in on the legal stuff too. In this post Weinstein Me Too world, how has contracting and deal making changed? You know, a lot has changed in the last five years in terms of what we'll accept. I don't know, was that five years? Time has no concept meaning anymore, but you know what I'm saying? Like, there's been a lot of shifts. So, how has that changed what you're teaching your students, what you were doing when you were at Merrimax, because you were there during a time of great change, I think? So, so how did, how, what have you seen in terms of? of how it's changing the agreements that are made and the legalese that's used. Before we get onto that, yeah. I would like to talk about the diversity aspect. And one of the great things that I can do is to affect change in the legal, uh, uh, the school law school setting. In that when you think about a law professor, what's the image that first comes to mind? And usually it's someone who's white. Old white man old white man with a bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was given the freedom to create my own syllabus. And I bought wow. in guest lecturers who were uh, experienced, established uh, uh, in-house attorneys and uh, graduates of Morehouse or Howard and that. And my students really responded to that. They, they came up to me after class and said, you know what? Thank you for bringing a diverse uh, voices and mm -hmm. attorneys who we 
didn't know, you know, were able to be successful. And I had um, uh, Asian American mom say, oh, it's, you're, it's nice to see someone who can be a role model for my daughter. So that's, so every way that each of us it's can there. affect change, it's something that we can all do. Excellent. In whatever position we have. Definitely, absolutely. Um, and and have you seen a change? It may not even be in the legalese. It could even be in, in the way the students think about these things, um, but also the law. Like if you, because because we are changing our expectations. In theory, the law was always there to protect us, but it wasn't doing its job, right? So right. have you seen a, a shift in the way contracts are being written, the way deals are being made? Uh, oh, yes. But no, because a lot of entertainment law is really based on precedent. Mm -hmm. And so there is that awareness of what's happening out there. But on the other hand, most of the contracts are very much still what has been before. Right. Because it was always in the contracts. It just wasn't really that we were supposed to behave like human beings. Right. Yeah. It isn't what was happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, Okay, so let me ask, what difference did any of you noticed in how social media backlash and cancel culture affects men versus women, people of color, underserved groups? Do you have you noticed that that you feel like you're def defending certain groups more, or, def or seeing more more issues with certain groups? I mean, yeah, I, I can start, I guess, on this one. Um, I, I, I think it affects the people who have the most power, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, or at least that's the sense I get um, in, on, on my side of things. I think uh, it's sort of bizarre as an artist, the thing that, not that I'm like, you know, Picasso, but just any type of person on the creative side of this, um, the stuff that gets us into doing this work is often feeling different or other. It, it can be, not always. Um, and then you kind of get to a place where you actually have amassed some sort of um, more agency or power or whatever. And then maybe sometimes that keeps you insulated. So I feel like in, and I'm talking like on a very granular, like conversations with people kind of level, it feels like the people who benefit the most from a patriarchal white, let's say it all together, patriarchal white supremacy. <laughs> um, that's what we live in. Um, but the people who benefit the most from that um, seem like the people whose bubbles have popped the most or have burst right. the most. And I, again, haven't, I have not worked with people who have been, um, you know, like outright canceled, they're gone. Um, but I just mean in terms of like awakening or, or awareness, yeah. But it's just you say that because one of the things that made me ask that question is that you see some people get canceled and they, they're just gone. And some people get canceled and they canceled and they win an Emmy. Like it's, <laughs> it's, it's a little interesting to watch, but I think it does sort of go in that patriarchal. I think that's, that's certainly true. <laughs> I, so you haven't been in person, had an experience. Have you had this? You don't need to get into what it was, but Wendy, have you been involved or, or touched by one of these cancel campaigns, either connected to one of your shows or one of your talent or, or anything where you've actually seen what it's like to be involved? Uh, well, you know, I mean, a few years ago when the Me Too movement first exploded, um, I, I was around uh, at my job mm -hmm. and there were some people who were in the news. Um, it seemed like every week there was a new person just because you know, PBS has been around forever and there have been lots of different celebrities who've been there. So every other week we would hear about some new person and we were just trying, it's kind of like you're trying to figure out how, how to react and how to respond and what's appropriate um, at the same time that you're getting the barrage and, and just trying to figure it out. So it was a it, it, it was very intense uh, for for the staff, as I can imagine that it was for everyone else um, that was around these folks. And 
I would, you know, obviously things have died down, but I think we learned so much from that time period yeah. um, in terms of not just, I, I would say that people look, look at talent a little bit more closely now before signing on the dotted line. And I think that part of that has been some of those learnings. Um, not that you can predict what's going to happen in the future, obviously, but I think people are taking a closer look at, yeah. at who, who they're going to hold hands with uh, moving forward. Yeah, they have to. I have, what, did, do you have any experiences to share? And I'm also curious about something that those of us watching from the outside don't understand about it. You may not have anything, but as I ask this question, like, is there something when we're watching this go down as total outsiders that we might be missing? Like, well, for that, me, like a, just a personal thing, experience that happened to me that really shocked me was about a year and a half ago, I was going into my, um, what work at Miramax, which is in Century City. And I'm short, so I have to like take off my belt, my seatbelt, and like really reach out to get the ticket. And this guy in back of me starts honking on his like his in the car. And so when after I parked, I'm like, who does this? Who's like honking furiously? It's only like a second or two of waiting. And so I caught up with him at at the elevator banks and he's on the phone and he looks at me and says, I got to go talking to the person on the line and says, I got to go. There's a crazy Asian lady uh, who can't drive and she's going to be in the elevator with me. And then he starts glaring at me while he's going up the elevator. And I have no idea why. And I don't know why my the fact that I'm Asian has anything to do with it. There was nothing about me like being a bad driver and he's just like then saunters out of the elevator and I, I was appalled and I didn't know what to do I just thought that was a very racist remark and this was during the time when Asian American women were just being attacked out of the blue right. and so I asked um, my friends some said I was overreacting some were horrified by it and so I think he just thought I was a, uh, I was not dressed. Um, I was in my casual clothes. Right. And, and so uh, some of my friends said, you know what, talk to, it was a guy, it was an attorney. It turned out he's an attorney. Cause. Uh, Are you going to tell us you called him in instead of calling him <laughs> out? Is that what you're about I, to tell us? I love Bob, it. Yeah. Bob Darwell. It turned out cause I could just look on the website and it was Shepard Mullen. And so I called the law firm and was able to talk to uh the the supervising attorney there and said this is what happened and they were appalled and uh the head of the national practice called me and apologized for his behavior and said Shepard Mullins not like that were and then when I talked to my colleague he actually said you know what we were going to ha have him hired to do extra work for us we were just thinking about it and now we're not interesting yeah. So that, so then on the other hand, you know, like a year and a half later, yeah, uh, like he has a big um, one page ad taken out from his law firm, you know, congratulating right. him. He's like one of the top 99 impact attorneys. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not like, you know, with, so there you go. But maybe he learned the lesson. We don't know. Maybe that's why he, I mean, that's okay. So this actually ties into one of my questions is, you know, this issue of calling in versus calling out, right? Um, do you see a positive use for the public cancel culture calling out? Like it did bring us me too. Like, is there a place for it? Or do you think that we've had a couple successes and maybe it's not the best way? Like, what are your thoughts on this? You've noticed I've been trying not to use the word cancel culture because it's not just about cancellation. It's about the way we share information. It's about, you know, in a lot of ways, what I went through was tied to what was happening on Twitter, right? That spread this. So it isn't just about getting canceled. But going back to my question, um, how how do you feel about this? Like, do you do you think there's ever a reason to to do it on social media? Do you think? I mean, if if people hadn't called out very powerful men out on social media. I don't know that we would even know about these things. Right. And 
interestingly enough, I think when we started hearing about certain people, then all of a sudden you start hearing a little story over here, another story over there, and then all of these other stories start coming out. And I'm sure a lot of women have had this, you know, they're like, oh, I thought that just happened to me mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago. And all of a sudden you realize it's happened to like 500 people. Um, but without those people getting called out so publicly, I don't know that any of that would have come to light. I, I mean, I don't know, but it certainly was a wake up call. Um, and, and it made a lot of other people feel brave enough to come out. So I feel like I have this conversation every other day, or at least I had this conversation every other day, whether it was at work or at home with my husband, where we were debating who, who was a real creep and who wasn't, right? And who deserved right. it and who didn't. And I think we all had those conversations, right? So interesting conversations, but uh I don't I don't have any regret about some of the people who were canceled because they it's, had to it's go. It's interesting because one of the reasons I asked about things we wouldn't know is because I honestly do know that I watched one happen. And what I found really interesting is that you're not allowed to speak, even if it's not true. And I was watching someone get taken down for something they didn't do and they weren't allowed to defend themselves. It was really a fascinating mm -hmm. thing. But so there's this positive thing that we absolutely need it for, but it can also spin off in these really negative ways. It's Agreed. That's true of everything. There's a good and a bad. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, Nina, did you have any thoughts? I, I feel like yeah. I mean, I, I feel like my opinion is kind of worth the, the same as any anyone listening in on this. Is just like how do we feel about what's going on right now? But I will say I do. I obviously people have families there's tremendous pain that's involved I, i'm not a socioanthropologist i don't know how many of these are bots i haven't like studied you know like <laughs> the uh statistics on cancel culture i feel just a feeling i feel um a lot of hope from from what this means for long term equality um, because I feel like for the first time, marginalized groups have some agency. And I feel like, you know, if the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, how awesome that we live in a time where people that never would have been empowered or had any kind of platform to speak up and stand out get to. That is, that to me is fantastic. Yeah. You know, and I grew up with both of my parents still have accents my mom's English isn't the best and I work in my job as English, you know, but I grew up seeing and we didn't grow up with a ton of money. Like I grew up seeing how vulnerable being a part of a marginalized group is and just feeling having to translate for her sometimes. And so, yeah, that that side of me, that little kid in me is very happy that there has been a cultural shift, you know, and and is and is optimistic for what this means over the next 17 years because i think until 2040 population growth wise you know by 2040 i think um white people will be the minority in this country and i and i don't see this i feel like we're going to hear more of this and there it's it's gonna maybe the gear screech will get louder you know to right. some extent because we're navigating something very very new and it's also interesting the, that twitter has been such a central part of this and it's imploding and I think it'll be mm. you can't even guess what that's going to mean but um I think with a, as with everything that's happening it's a very interesting time to be alive but you know wh where's this discourse going to happen if if half of us leave twitter I don't, shouldn't say it like that <laughs> but you know if 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 only one part of the conversation is having on twitter where are we going to take it I mean how do you see this conversation evolving have you thought about that at all I've thought about a hope, which is that I, I'd like to see, this feels crazy to say as an American, but I'd like to see like truly as an American as a, and as a consumer of media, I, I would hope that we are able to carve pathways for more forgiveness and redemption. If a person makes a mistake, does something wrong, and then genuinely takes a beat, learns from it, and and is able to kind of show how people come back from making mistakes, I think that would be healing for our culture. And I think it would be nice to welcome people back who have done that. And that's starting to happen a little bit. Again, I'm not a socioanthropologist, but but um but I do feel like maybe that is an element that's missing, you know, but I get it. It's people are hurt. Right. Right. 
it's interesting going back people are heard to change how often are you are all these things you just talked about in the back of your head as you're creating or fueling your or are you actually thinking them in the front of your head like when you I know you can't make a joke that way but when you're just thinking about telling a story like is this what's happening in the back or are you sometimes even doing it up here oh boy <laughs> I don't I don't know is the truth I don't know uh probably not in the forefront no just because off the rip it doesn't feel super funny to me how can I address this whole cultural population gene <laughs> like it's not exactly it, you know it comes from more like hey here's what's pissing me off today or here's something crazy I saw on the way in or here's something that happened 20 years ago that I just remembered in a dream or, you know it doesn't it doesn't come that way but sometimes something will piss me off enough where I'll be like we got it we got it talk about this and then usually that's a crappy story <laughs> but sometimes sometimes it'll spark a good discussion and then something will come from it yeah that's really interesting because a lot of times we're watching television by the way people you can add questions if you'd like to to put questions in the q a i should remind people and now i don't even remember what i was about to say i lost my thought because i thought about asking for questions <laughs> um does anyone have a, a thought that they want to share something we haven't dived into yet no yeah you, you, br you bring up a good point about twitter because we have been using it to learn about new things but also now with the new owner it seems like there's also more hate and more um just a lot of more distressing uh emphasis on like the negative things right. on it's interesting also that there's there's a we haven't even talked we haven't used the word politics I don't know why I put that in quotes but that's a big part of what's caused this divide that's happening right now. Do you think of your jobs as political Wendy and Nina or do you like because it's become political what you're creating has become part of the political discourse part of the social especially on social media, so do you consider what you're doing to be political or are you just spread doing your art and spreading knowledge and you know well i mean the way that i see it is that i'm i'm working with really creative people who have something interesting provocative to say in a in a really fantastic way that other people haven't been able to bring that idea to life um and i know that because some of those topics now are considered political i mean now history is considered political right exactly it shouldn't be things that actually happened in yeah. history yeah. are considered yeah. political yeah so if someone has that for that that lens then they're going to consider my job political to me i i'm actually telling untold stories and i'm actually helping to fill in the gaps in in the way that history was taught to me and in the way that history is even being taught to my kids um so if someone wants to see that as political, I feel like I'm setting the record straight. I'm helping to set the record straight. Um, right. Do with that what you may. So it's interesting that we even have to to think this way about that 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 our content has become politicized. That everything we do actually has become politicized. Do you think this comes from one of our guests and a BW board member, Kathy Parafimos? Do you think that cancel culture dulls creativity because people are more cautious to avoid cancellation or scandal? It seems that certain shows are delivering plot lines that are very literally addressing certain social issues in near PSA style formats. Is it a nod towards wokeness? <laughs> um, what do you think? It's funny, I have to say Grey's Anatomy popped to mind. I mean, that is what their programming is this year. It's it's all informational. But do you do you see that? Do you feel like your creativity is being dulled? I have I have such a sassy comment to that. I Take it. We like sassy. <laughs> I'm just like watch better shows. <laughs> no, but 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 to not be horrible for a second, uh, it really does depend on who's talking, right? Because there are the 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 benefit of this is that there are so many awesome new voices out there. And and they, I would say, have been empowered to speak in an in an environment where they wouldn't have been 10, 20 years ago. 
So watch that because that doesn't feel like a PSA. That feels incredibly authentic and new and different. And if you can't stomach that, yeah, you might have to have a little bit of compassion for the old guard that's trying to figure out how to do it in this new different landscape. Such a shifting landscape. It was interesting when I was preparing for this, thinking about how much entertainment has changed over the decades, over the recent years, you know, going all the way back, it wasn't black and white. There were 15 minute television shows. Now we have streaming, like it's, it's, it's been a continuum. We think of it as something that's just happening now, but entertainment has been shifting and moving and um, for, since it started really. I, by the way, I personally don't feel creatively stifled. No. Maybe I will one day, probably, but right now, no, I, I feel more empowered to be, it's funny, I was like going through old boxes and I found something I wrote in high school and the character was white and her experience, this is like, it was all like loosely stuff I had gone through, but it had to, but I felt like, well, I couldn't write about being Persian, you know, like, ugh, you know, but now it's quite the opposite. I get to be as specific as, you know, as I want. And, and that's, that's, that feels very different as a creative. Yeah. And you're a satirist, which also I think breeds a bit of creativity, right? Because your, your whole goal is to push. I mean, it's hard to do today, although you don't seem to feel too pressured, which is nice to hear. No, I don't. No. I feel like I have an obligation to educate myself, you know, and I, and I hope that that was something I was going to say is, and I don't want to speak too much, but I do feel like one of the benefits of this as an artist is that the culture that we live in now demands a level of authenticity and decency of me inside and out. And that, that is not a bad thing. You know, like we hold our artists to a different standard. I think they will disappoint us. I'm sure I have to the people that know me sometimes, but the benefit of it is that that transparency can push us to become better people, you know, and read books we haven't and have conversations we haven't. And right. And anybody who is listening to this as who maybe does more generative or creative stuff, I would hope that just living as authentically don't write characters that you haven't interacted with or, you know, like, um, yeah. Don't tell stories you don't know. I yeah. think that's a, and it's funny because they used to say, write what you don't know. I mean, write what you know. It meant more, it, was, it wasn't about what we're talking about now. Now it's more like, be who you are right where you know. So we have a question from Daphne Philipson. Is it true that in other decades there was some sort of committee that decided if something was appropriate to show on TV? If yes, is that still happening now? So I know part of this answer. The networks have their standard and practices. Wendy, you might have a, a more full, a more well-rounded yeah. answer to this. Right, because uh, we, you know, we're on, on broadcast also. So we have to adhere to FCC standards, the same as ABC, NBC, and the other networks. So there are things that, uh, you know, whether it's nudity or whether it's certain uh, profanity that you can't have on TV and you have to bleep it or you have to, uh, what is it, wipe it. Um, so those are the things that sometimes they look for, especially if it's on at a certain time of day. The same way as if you were at, on, you know, Good Morning America, um, and you're not, not going to drop an f bomb on that show, or if you do, they're going to bleep it. So, um, yeah, I mean, FCC standards apply. And then sometimes networks have their own standards, so that you have two. If anybody watching actually watches um, NBC's Days of Our Lives you might have noticed that they have gone from being a network show that has to fit all these rules that we're talking about to being a Peacock streaming shows, which means they can have nudity. They can drop the F-bomb if they want. They're so not it's going spicy crazy. Now. It, they, it, they've, they've spiced it up a little. They had the first like three-way, I think, in daytime history. Although, is it daytime now that it's streaming? I don't know. But the point is that it's an interesting thing because you can see the shift happen that by going into streaming that I guess doesn't have to follow those rules yet, um, you don't have to follow them anymore. Hmm. Which is one of the many ways the business is changing. They are free. <laughs> Nina, do you get given boundaries when you're writing for that? Yeah, BSNP is what it's called at Wendy. I think you mentioned it too, but business standards and practices. And in my experience, the, you know, it's a network studio person who we work with um, anytime a draft gets sent out, we have like, you know, 
on the shows I've worked on, quite a long list of like, you can't say that, uh, don't do that, please don't do that. <laughs> we said don't do that, you know, that kind of stuff. Seriously, you guys don't do that. Um, yeah, so we, there is sort of an internal check in that way. Um, One of the things I enjoy is when knowing this, sometimes in a, a sitcom or comedy, you see them get away with something and you don't know how they got away. Like there was something where they used the word balls and they were definitely talking about, you know, it was like something that would have somehow they slid it by the standards and then they just went with it because they were like, well, they're not catching it. <laughs> and it, when you know that they're getting one by you, it's kind of by the, the group, it's kind of fun. We had a great woman on New Girl who, I'm forgetting her name right now, she loved her job. She was tickled by any time she had to tell us no. It was a really lovely collaborative experience. <laughs> where she it wasn't like she was a downer at all she was just like you guys come on now like it, yeah so uh no even in that situation where you're being told no it doesn't feel creatively stifling and look at the end of the day if it means more people get to watch the story that's not so bad right um uh that so, can be very nice those boundaries look when i bowl with bumpers i score more points <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny um, we have an anonymous question. I feel like there is a general debasement of our cultural, of our culture that's evident on TV. So much violence and foul language. Digitally, I don't mind the foul language, but I, or the sex, but I do feel like the, for me personally, that's my personal response, that it's the increased violence that I can't stand. But what, what do you think as creators and, and development peeps and, and lawyers? I think our most violent show is Frontline, and <laughs> and it's real. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, maybe nature. There's yeah. more stuff. You, being made it's interesting. Than ever, right? I don't. I don't know that I. Oh, did I freeze? Sorry, did I freeze or did you freeze? Okay, you were going to speak. Oh yeah. Um. Uh, there's more content being made than ever, right? So, you know, in the 80s, there was less than 100 TV shows. Now there's something like 500. Um, I will say my first reaction, and maybe if this, maybe this is defensive, but my first reaction is, I'm not sure that our culture has changed that much. I think people have always, humans have always been wonderful and awful to each other. I just think we're seeing more of it now. You know, it's not like cussing didn't happen 60 years ago. It's not like cheating didn't happen or sex didn't happen. It does feel like it's, we're maybe just showing more of it. I mean, yes. Lucy couldn't say the word pregnant. She had to say we're in the family way. Lucy and Ricky slept in beds for so many separate twin beds for so many seasons. That's hilarious now, you know? Um, you know, I just learned recently that in daytime TV, you have, when they're in the bed together, naked but they're not naked there, there has to be a sheet between them it's like a rule and there are certain things so there are still strange rules about sexuality but and no you can't see the vomit come out but we can see someone get shot it's interesting <laughs> where we draw the where, not we where the government has drawn the lines on those things but i don't yeah to be to the anonymous um person asking the question i don't think that you're crazy crazy i i, I don't think john wick is a series that is like, well, that's true to life. That's been happening for hundreds of years. Like, <laughs> no, there is an increase for sure. Yeah. And I don't, I would actually love to hear, um, uh, Ayana, what you, what your take on this is because you work so much more in kind of the, like Miramax, I think of these huge, big budget, you know, productions. I know for me, I don't like violence, although you spoke about John Wick. It's one of my favorite movies of 2023. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really selective of what I watch because I don't like to watch violence. And so, yes, I, um, it all depends on what we're watching. And it is kind of upsetting to see for, to see that in our society, now that th this is going to hold different tangent about how, um, there's a shooting almost every other day it seems like yeah. so you know is that because of media and what's being consumed out there because I'm not I'm not really um privy or I don't look at like violent video games or movies 
I mean, I grew up with violent video games and movies and, and people didn't shoot people as much as they do now. I mean, you know, that's, that's, I wish we actually tried to get an anthropologist on this because we thought that might be an interesting mm -hmm. element looking at kind of this cultural, you know, none of what we're going through is new. We're just using new mediums to do it. Whether we're talking about creating content or discussing these issues, the rapid social discourse, you know, the way things are happening. It's the technology that's new. I don't really think it's the problems that are new. And I think, as Nina said, the upshot of it all is that it's allowing us to not just be more authentic, but to have more people involved, to invite more people into the cultural conversation of entertainment, right? Which is a good thing. Um, even yeah, which is some yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's such a great thing, though, because when we had the campaign of Oscar So White, you know, a lot of people, I think, just came to the realization that uh, there are other groups out there that, that have a voice. And it's it's usually, you know, when, when I grew up in the, the 80s and 90s, I always had to scan for the Asian American face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's nice to be able to see more people and win the awards. Yes. <laughs> and win the, the sweep. <laughs> That must be better than just seeing one win to have a beautiful sweep like that. So we're we're just about at any time. Does anybody have any final thoughts? Something we haven't kind of dived into or covered that you've been thinking about this issue? Um, something that excites you about this issue? I feel like we've tapped it all, but a last chance to to get a final thought out there. Okay. Well, I got one. I got one. I you got one. You got one. Um report something if it happens. Um, I didn't talk about my own experiences, although I do have them, but uh, it's always surprising to have that internal debate with oneself and then actually make the decision to say something and realize, oh, two other women have also, oh, there's a, oh, there's a file on this person. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and not just for ourselves, but for the m men and women who come after us um so calling in has its place but uh i think we also have a responsibility to to call out and to and to note it yeah i agree it's a hard line to draw but i mean that's that's what growth is right growth is not easy especially not for an entire country um okay well thank you for sharing your time with us today I think we're actually about six minutes early, but um, I thank you for your time and your insight on this important and timely topic. I'd also like to thank Angela and my BW counterparts and for bringing this together. Um, we invite everyone to continue this conversation online. Well, I'm sorry, Nina, not you, because you're not in Barnard, but but we'll see you online and we'll follow you. This and just and see re-triggers everything I felt as a woman in Columbia College. Also, but we're so interested, just link in with me. I'm on LinkedIn, Ayana Uchida. And uh, anybody's interested in going to law school or is an attorney or even just thinking about going to law school or being in California or LA. I love Connect it. And, and I love our, starting, our final parting thought, thought to be speak up whether it's for yourself or somebody else whether you're calling in or calling out to 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 be there to speak in some way right however we choose to resolve it um thank you very much and uh please remember to take care of yourselves and each other and have a lovely evening thank you thank you guys i mean sorry you ladies <laughs> for joining me thank you for having me Thank My you. pleasure. Bye.